Hi, my name is Pierre-Olivier Ellis. I'm a geophysicist with Total. And today my e-lecture will be about the gas mass fluid substitutions. We will go through a tutorial show you, showing you a workflow that can be uh, helpful in order to get good results and uh, robust results. So fluid substitution for a geophysicist, it's an essential step. In, uh, whether you are an exploration geophysicist or a reservoir geophysicist, you will always have to use this kind of uh, substitutions because this will help you a lot uh, to interpret your, your seismic. For instance, you can have some very high seismic anomalies on your seismic and you want to know whether it's linked to the presence of a fluid like oil or gas. Or maybe if you are working with 4D seismic, you would like to see the changes in your seismic when you will replace oil by water, for instance, or oil with gas. So these kind of uh, exercises, uh, they need to be handled properly. And in the industry, it is widely used, uh, the gas mass equations, to, to achieve this, uh, these challenges. So my presentation will be uh, made into five points, in five points. First, we'll go together through the prerequisites. We need to talk a little bit about rock physics, what is at the heart of the rock, and which will control uh, the response of the, of the rock to a seismic wave. So we will talk about elastic moduli and we will talk about velocities. Then, once we are at ease with these uh, fundamentals, we will uh, go through the, the gas mass equations and uh, spend a little bit of time on the fundamental assumptions. Because gas mass equations, they are very powerful, but you should use them only in a given setting of assumptions. If you are outside these assumptions, then the results may be false. And that's very important to know these assumptions properly. Then we we'll go through the ingredients of the equation. It's made of different stuff. You'll see the equation maybe looks a bit frightening at the beginning, but once we know the ingredients better, we can go through the fluid substitution recipe and get some very good and appetizing results in the end. So to finish with this presentation, we will uh, go through the pitfalls, which are kind of linked to the fundamental assumptions that we have seen at first. And we will try to uh, give some ideas or some uh, tips about the extensions of the gas mass uh, relationships that can be used to tackle these pitfalls. So before entering into the gas mass equations, we need to, to know what exactly is at the heart of the rock. And what is at the heart of the rock, and which will be responsible for eventually for the seismic response, are the elastic moduli and the density of the rock. So let's start with uh, the bulk modulus. The bulk modulus of an isotropic rock is actually the ratio of the hydrostatic stress that you apply to the, a rock and the volumetric strain that this stress will, uh, will, will do on the rock. So let's have a look at this little picture. Imagine a piece of rock. I will apply a pressure which is the same all around the, the rock. And because of this pressure, the rock will contract a little bit and it will resist to this contraction. And the resistance uh, to this, to this uh, pressure from the rock is called the bulk modulus. And as you can see in this equation, the bulk modulus is consistent with uh, a pressure. It's expressed in uh, gigapascal. And the higher the bulk modulus, the stiffer the rock. So the bulk modulus can be determined in the lab or in the, in the field using log data because uh, the bulk modulus can be derived from, from the P-wave velocity, the S-wave velocity, and the density. You can also derive the bulk modulus by applying the pressure and measuring the strain on the rock using strain gauges in the lab. So you have different possibilities to eventually get the result uh, of the bulk modulus. Another very important uh, modulus, elastic modulus, is the shear modulus. Contrary to the bulk modulus, it's not the reaction of the rock to a constant pressure around in all directions, but it's the reaction of a rock to a shear stress that we apply uh, to the piece of rock. So the higher the shear modulus of the rock, the stiffer the rock, and the more resistance we get from the rock when we apply this shear stress uh, to, to two of its faces. Again, the shear modulus is expressed in gigapascal. It's uh, consistent with the pressure. And it can be measured in the lab, either using strain gauges that will uh, measure exactly the strain induced by the stress applied, or using the S-wave measurement and density measurement. 
because the shear modulus mu is expressed as being the product of density and square the S wave velocity. Good, so elastic moduli are at the heart of uh, elastic wave propagation in rocks. Actually, we have two main uh, types of waves propagating in rocks. The first one is the compressional wave or P wave. And this wave is such that the, the polarization of the wave is parallel to its uh, direction, meaning that if the wave propagates from left to right, then the particles are going to move in the same direction exactly. And the, the velocity of this P wave is given by this equation, the VP, is equal to square root of the bulk modulus plus four thirds of the shear modulus, all that divided by the bulk density. Very important to note that if we express the bulk modulus and the shear modulus in gigapascal, then the compressional velocity that we get in the end would be in kilometers per second, which is quite different from what we are used to, to use in uh, SI units because we are more used to using uh, meter per second. So be very careful about this. Then we have the shear wave, which is different from the compressional wave in that the polarization of the particles is perpendicular to the direction of the wave. And the shear wave velocity is given by this equation. It's square root of the shear modulus divided by the bulk density. So as you can see, we don't have any impact of the bulk modulus in the shear wave velocity, meaning that this shear wave velocity will be always lower than the P wave velocity. And that's why the P, velocity, the P wave is always coming faster than the, the shear wave. It's very important also to note that there is like a competition between the numerator, the, the velocities, and the denominator. You see you have the, the elastic moduli at the numerator and the density at the, numer at the denominator. Sometimes if you replace the fluid which is inside the porosity of your rock, you will have, for instance, the, the elastic moduli increase, but also the density will increase. So there will be this kind of competition between the two, so that in the end, we don't really know what the P-wave velocity will do. Will it increase? Will it decrease? Will it be stable? We don't really know that. And we need to assess this very precisely, for instance, using the Gassman's equations. Here they are. These Gassman's equations, they may seem a bit complicated at first, but we will try to go through them step by step together and to assess each of these terms so that we are at ease in the end with, uh, with these equations. What is the problem? The problem is to, to change uh, the fluid which is inside the porosity uh, of a rock. Let's imagine that we have a rock filled with, say, water. We know its density, we know its uh, P and S wave velocities, and we would like to know how this density and these velocities will be changed when we replace water by, say, oil or gas, for instance. To do so, we will start with the elastic moduli of the rock. So let's start with the easiest one, which is the shear modulus. One of the main postulates of Gassman's equations is that the fluid has actually no influence on the shear rigidity, meaning that whatever the fluid you put in your porosity, the shear modulus will not change. So that's quite easy to handle. How to understand that, however? In fact, you can imagine the porosity or pore inside the rock as being a volume like this, and when you shear the pore and the fluid which is inside, in fact, you would change the shape of the pore, but you will not change the volume of this pore. And changing the shape of a fluid is very easy, so we can understand that whatever the fluid you have in the porosity is not going to change the overall shear modulus of the rock. Then when it comes to the bulk modulus of the rock, it's a bit more complicated, because the fluid which is inside the porosity of the rock, it will stiffen the rock compared to when the rock is completely dry, without fluid. And in fact, to know what increase of stiffness we get from the fluid, we need to use the second, second part of the Gassman's equation, which is given in this slide. In this equation, you see that we have a lot of different terms. The first one being the Ksat. This is the bulk modulus of the saturated rock. Then we have what we call K-dry. That's a very important one. It's the bulk modulus of the dry rock, meaning the, the rock without any fluid inside. Then we have KFL, the bulk modulus of the fluid which is inside the rock. We have K-min, which is the bulk modulus of the mineral that makes up the rock. And finally, we have the porosity of the rock, 
which also plays a very important role. We will go through that in the next slide, step by step again, in order to understand exactly what each of these terms may have as an impact in the gas mass equations. Good. Before applying the gas mass equations, we need to know what the fundamental assumptions are, because gas mass equations are very powerful. They are physical, they give you an actual result, which is reality. But if you don't know the assumptions that are behind this, you can misuse these equations and get something which is actually completely wrong. So the first assumption is that the rock is homogeneous and isotropic. Homogeneous it means that the, your rock should be made of the same mineral. All the grains making up the rock should be from the same mineral. If you have grains coming from different minerals, say for instance quartz and calcite, these two minerals they have very different bulk moduli. And then you cannot merge them easily in the equations. So be sure that the rock you are uh, studying is homogeneous first. Then it has to be isotropic. If your rock is strongly anisotropic, then the gas mass equations are not correct. And you should use uh, an equation which is a bit more evolved. The second fundamental assumption for gas mass equations is that the pore space is completely connected and saturated. It's very important that we consider a connected porosity because the fluid must be able to flow in the porosity. That's one very important point. And then the porosity must be saturated everywhere. If it's only partially saturated, then the gas mass equations are not correct. And last but not least, the third assumption in gas mass equation is that the pore pressures are equilibrated throughout the pore space, meaning that we should investigate the rock with low frequencies. The wave passing through the rock should be quite low frequency. And this is to make sure that the fluid has time enough to flow in the porosity, because otherwise, if it's kind of constrained by a very high frequency, the fluid will stiffen the rock uh, because the, the pressure won't be equilibrated throughout the pore space. For instance, if you are using ultrasonic measurement in your rock, then the fluid may not have time enough to flow, and that will increase the stiffness of your rock. You can imagine, for instance, having a sieve that you want to put in water. If you put this sieve very slowly, then it's going to be very easy to, to sink the sieve. But then imagine that you do this very fast movement, and then the sieve will not penetrate water easily. It's kind of the same analogy that we, we could say for the, the pore pressures. If the frequency of your seismic wave is very low, then the fluid can flow easily throughout the, the pore space. But then if the frequency of the wave is too high, the fluid doesn't have time to flow, and that will kind of artificially increase the stiffness of your rock. So let's first have a look at uh, the porosity, which is one of the gas mass equation uh, ingredient in a way. Porosity is, is very important in a rock, obviously, but there are different kinds of porosities. So let's try to, to describe exactly what we are talking about with uh, this porosity. So as you may know, as you know, I'm sure the total porosity is the ratio of pore volumes to the total volume of your rock. In the figure that you have to, to the left, this is represented by the black areas. Then the total porosity can be split into an effective porosity, which is the amount of interconnected porosity, meaning all the voids which are connected one with each other and in which the fluid can easily flow. And then the second part of this total porosity could be a porosity which is disconnected from the effective porosity. Then in the end, this disconnected porosity is the total porosity minus the effective porosity. In gas mass equations, obviously we have to use the effective porosity, because you remember that the fluid should be able to flow easily in the porosity. Again, if we have a look at the picture on the left, and this is a nice uh, limestone from uh, the book of Bourbier and Zinsner. You can see that we have some porosity which is connected, effective porosity outside the oolite. But if we zoom in on one of the oolite, you can see some very, very small micro porosity. And this one is not connected to the macro porosity. So in that case, we would have an effective porosity which is really lower than the, the total porosity. So keep that in mind, in gas mass equations, we are talking about effective porosity. Then in the equation, we have the matrix 
bulk modulus, which we have called k-min. K-min is also a very important parameter, and it obviously depends on the mineral that makes up the rock, the rock you are studying. Most of the time, I guess, you will be uh, handling sandstones, which are made of quartz. And from this table, you see that the bulk modulus of uh, quartz is 36.6. Sometimes it can, go, it can be 38, depending on the authors. And the shear modulus is 45 gigapascal. The density then of the quartz mineral is 2.65. These are very important values that I'm sure you will be using in your career. Then have a look at the other minerals. You can see that calcite, for instance, for instance or dolomite, they have a higher bulk modulus and shear modulus than the quartz. And this is why, again, you remember this first assumption, we cannot mix easily quartz and calcite when we are using Gassman's equations, because then the difference between the bulk modulus is far too high. Now have a look at the fourth line of this table. It is talking about clay, and you see that we don't have specific values for clay, and that's very important. Clay is a very changing uh, material, a very changing uh, matrix, and we cannot say that the bulk modulus, the shear modulus of the density of clay will be such. This has to be derived from the measurements that you have on the field. Very often you will have to handle shady sands, meaning not very clean sands, sands which have a proportion of shales inside. And it can be a problem because if your shales, if your clay has a very different bulk and shear modulus from quartz, then the mix that you have of quartz and clay may be difficult to handle in Gassman's equation. Remember that according to the first assumption, the rock must be homogeneous. And if your clay is too far away from your quartz in terms of bulk and shear moduli, then you will not be able to apply Gassman's equations directly. So to handle properly shady sands, you need to work a bit more in detail, and this is actually not the, the subject of this tutorial. Towards the end of, the ta of this table, you can see some very heavy minerals like pyrite and siderite, which you don't, you're not likely to encounter very often. But you can see at least the, the huge variation of bulk and shear moduli that you can have depending on the mineral you are considering. Then another parameter that we have in Gassman's equation is the dry rock bulk modulus, which we call K-dry. And this is a very important one because it's kind of the pivot of all the equation. K-dry is actually the low frequency or drained bulk modulus of the rock. Imagine that the fluid could flow completely out of the rock very easily, then you would get the bulk modulus of the rock. You could also say that the bulk modulus, the dry bulk modulus of the rock, is the bulk modulus of your rock without any fluid at all in the porosity. But be careful of something. We have the tendency to, to believe that a gas-filled rock is dry, but it's not real, because at reservoir conditions, the bulk modulus of gas cannot be neglected. So there are two ways to get K-dry. Either you measure it in the lab, which is one possibility, or you can actually derive it, derive it using Gassman's equation in the form which is shown in this slide. Let's now talk about the fluid, uh, the fluid properties, because you have fluid in your porosity, and this fluid will take a part of the pressure increase made by the wave propagating. So we need to know the bulk modulus of this fluid and the density of it. Actually, you can know the bulk modulus and density of your fluid either directly from lab measurements, if you're lucky enough to have some uh, fluid samples available, or if you have an equation of state of your fluid, that's a complete model that will help you uh, determine according to pressure and temperature, for instance, the bulk modulus and the density of your fluid. Or most of the time what we are doing is that we use empirical equations from Batzel and Wang, for instance, something that I will develop afterwards in the next slide. Something which is kind of very important is to know how to mix fluids. Uh, for gas pens equations to be correct, the fluid should be mixed intimately at the finest scale. And in that case, if you have, for instance, oil and water in your porosity, the density of your mixture is just the arithmetic average of uh, the two fluids. For instance, if your water saturation is uh, 0.3 and your oil saturation is 0.7, then you will have 0.3 multiplied by the, the density of your water plus 0.7 multiplied by the density of your oil. As for the bulk modulus, we, we use what we call the Royce average, and this is actually 
the average which is given in this slide. In that case, we use the inverse of the, the bulk modulus of the fluid. And once we have made this average, we take the reverse of all of it. So here are some examples of Bazzola and Wags uh, equations. Um, you can find that on the internet if you, if you Google Bazzol and Han. And uh, this is very useful, again, to compute the, the bulk modulus and density of the fluid that you may have in your porosity. So here to the left in the red, you have an example for a gas case. In green in the middle, it's for a null case. And to the right in blue, it's for a water case. So I will develop a little bit on each uh, of these ones, starting with gas because it's probably the easiest one to, to handle. In order to compute the bulk modulus and density of gas uh, using Bazzol and Hans equations, we only need to know, some, to know the gas uh, specific, specific gravity, which is actually the density of the gas at standard condition compared to the density of air in the same standard condition. So a very light gas, like methane for instance, it will have a gas gravity of 0.6 and it can go up to 1.5 if your gas is heavier. Then once you know the specific gravity of your gas, you will just need to know the temperature and pressure and Bazzol and Hans equations will give you the associated bulk modulus and density of the gas. So that's very convenient indeed. So in this example, we have taken a very light gas like methane with a gas gravity of 0.6 and we have a temperature of 100 degrees centigrade and pressure of 25 megapascals. And directly from this, uh, from this plot, we can get the density of the gas and its bulk modulus, which are the red points that you can see to the left. Then let's move on the, the second plot, the green one with oil. This one is a bit more complicated because oil is made of a lot of different components and it's kind of complicated to, to assess the bulk modulus of uh, the oil and its density. In that case, we need a little bit more parameters. We need the GOR of the, the oil, the gas oil ratio. We need the dead density, dead oil density, which is the density of the oil once it is in standard condition and once all the gas that was dissolved in the oil has, uh, has been uh, freed. And the dead oil density can also be expressed in degrees API. It's exactly the same. There is a direct relationship between dead oil density and uh, degree API. So once you know these two parameters, GOR and dead oil gravity or API, again, you need the pressure and temperature at which your fluid is to get the bulk modulus and the density of your fluid. So again, check out in the middle of this slide the results that we have for a pressure of 250 bars at a temperature of 100 degrees for this uh, specific oil that we have here. So to the right, we have two plots giving the elastic properties of water according to pressure, temperature and salinity. For water, the main parameter is salinity. The more saline your water, the more dense it will be and the, more, the higher will be the, its bulk modulus. In this example, for instance, we consider a water with a salinity of 150,000 ppm again at a temperature of 100 degrees centigrade and a pressure of 20, 25 megapascal. You can check out on the plot the bulk density, the bulk modulus, sorry, and the density that Bazzol and Hans equations give for this water. So now we know all the ingredients that make up the Gassman's equations and we can try to mix up the ingredients to get the good recipe that uh, we need to do our fluid substitution. I think the best way to do that is to imagine an example and to apply the Gassman's workflow step by step together until we have the final result. So let's imagine a clean sandy reservoir. Clean, it means that the reservoir is only made of quartz grains. We don't have any shale within the sands. So let's imagine this clean sandy reservoir at 100 degrees centigrade, 250 bars. The elastic properties that have been measured in the wells are the following. The density is 2.13 grams per cubic centimeter. The P wave velocity is 2,525 meters per second. And the S wave velocity is 985 meters per second. The petrophysicist has worked extensively on this data set and he was able to find out that the sand was oil bearing. 
with an effective porosity of 30% and a water saturation of 35%. Using Basel and Hans formula, we can derive the elastic properties of water and oil at the given temperature and pressure, which are the following. The density of water is 1.07 grams per cubic centimeter. The bulk modulus of water is 3 gigapascal. The density of oil is 0.85 grams per cubic centimeter and the bulk modulus of oil is 1.3 gigapascal. So the question we have is what would be the elastic properties of this reservoir if it was water bearing? So let's start with the measured density and P and S wave velocities. First of all, we must extract the elastic moduli from these velocities and density. Remember that your velocities should be in kilometer per second if you want the bulk and shear moduli to be in gigapascal. So it's quite easy to compute the bulk modulus. It's just the product of density multiplied by square the P-wave velocity minus four-thirds of square the S-wave velocity, which in the end gives us an initial saturated bulk modulus of around 11 gigapascal. The shear modulus is even easier to compute it's just a product of density multiplied by square the S-wave velocity, and we have around 2 gigapascal in that case. Then obviously we need to compute the effective fluid properties, because we know the fluid property, the oil properties and the water properties, but actually we have a mixture of both oil and water, with a water saturation of 35%, and hence an oil saturation of 65%. So we will assume that they are perfectly mixed at the finer scale, and in that case, we can use the formula that I described, described previously. For the bulk modulus of the, the effective fluid, we can use the Royce average, and this will give us the bulk modulus of 1.62 gigapascal. And for the density, it's even easier. We just use an arithmetic mean, which in the, in the end gives us a 0.93 grams per cubic centimeter. Then, Starting from the, the initial saturated bulk modulus, we must compute the dry bulk modulus of the rock. Because the dry bulk modulus of the rock is something which is kind of constant. It's independent of the fluid, obviously. Okay? So we can use Gassman's equation in the form uh, that is written in the slide, knowing the initial satura uh, saturated bulk modulus, porosity and fluid modulus. It's very easy to compute the dry modulus and we get 7.67 gigapascal. Then we need to think of the new fluid properties. In our case, we want to put only water in the porosity, which is quite easy. We already know the properties of water, namely 3 gigapascal for the bulk modulus and 1.07 grams per cubic centimeters for the density. And then we will apply Gassman the other way around, starting now from the dry bulk modulus that we have computed previously and using the new fluid saturated state. We just have to use the equation which is written here in uh, bullet point number 6 and in the end we get 13.18 gigapascal. Next, we must think of the shear modulus. This one is very easy because according to Gassman's assumptions, the shear modulus is unchanged. So mu is still equal to 2.07 gigapascal. Don't forget to transform the density because we have changed the, the mixture of oil and water we had in the density in the porosity uh, by water. So eventually the new uh, density of the rock uh, will be 2.18 grams per, per cubic centimeter, slightly higher than before. Now we have all we need to compute the new velocities. Let's start with the shear wave velocity, which is the easiest one. As you remember, it's square root uh, the ratio between the shear modulus and the new uh, density of the rock, meaning square root of 2.07 divided by 2.18, which gives us, in the end, 975 meters per second. And then the P-wave velocity, we use the bulk modulus, new saturated bulk modulus that we have computed uh, using Gassman. The shear modulus is the same as before, and the denominator is the new density that we have computed together. And in the end, we get a velocity of 2,704 meters per second. So we have been able together to, to apply this Gassman's methodology, which is quite straightforward, actually. But again, it, it's only valid if your assumption, basic assumptions are valid and, uh, 
and met. So what are we doing in case one of these assumptions is not, uh, is not correct? For instance, what if the rock is not an homogeneous? This effective elastic modulus must then be computed using Voigt and Royce or ashing strickman bounds, but this is a little bit more complicated than uh, what is the purpose of this, uh, of this lecture. Then if we have shady sounds, re remember that we cannot use directly Gassman because the, the clay properties may be very different from the quartz properties. Then we have to assess the kind of clay model we have. Is it laminated clays, dispersed clays, or structural clays? And we must account for them properly. Again, this is too complicated to be explained in this e-lecture. But at least you know that uh, this is the way we should proceed. And what about if the rock is an isotropic? Then there is an extension of Gassman's equations, which were made by Brown and Coringa, and these relationships should be used instead of Gassman's equations. It's more complicated, but the idea is more or less the same as Gassman. Then, if the fluid is not homogeneously distributed throughout the porosity, um, this means that it's not going to flow easily and that the pressure will not be equilibrated throughout the porosity, and we must use another model uh, uh, than Gassman, which may be, for instance, the patchy saturation model from uh, Stanford University. And finally, if the frequencies of investigation are too high, or if the fluid is very viscous, then it may have difficulties to flow easily in the porosity. Then it's another model from Dan Gassman that should be used, for instance, the squirt flow model or the bio model. But these equations are much more complicated, and we cannot delve into that uh, in this uh, e-lecture. So we have seen together that Gassman's theory was a very powerful tool, which is actually widely used in the industry to tackle the fluid substitution problem. In this tutorial, we have applied Gassman's equation step by step, by hand, and this is very useful to understand actually how we should use these equations. So many softwares propose these equations embedded, but it's very difficult to know what exactly is going on behind the, the, the buttons that we, that we press. What is very important is to keep in mind the basic assumptions which underlie the theory from Gassman. So keep this in mind if you want to appropriately use the equations and if you want to be sure of the results that you get in the end. And last but not least, you should always be very critical with the results you have. For instance, K-dry, it's something which is physical, so you shouldn't have negative values, it cannot exist. If you have negative values in your K-dry computation, it means that somewhere in your computation you have a mistake. Maybe due to saturation, porosity, your K-mineral, which is not correct. But anyway, you have to check your input parameters to make sure that the K-dry you get in the end is positive. This was a pleasure to go through this Gassman tutorial uh, with you. I hope you will be able to use it and to apply that in your uh, geophysicist everyday life. And don't hesitate to subscribe to the EAGE YouTube channel in order to see some other e-lectures like this one. Thank you.